My friends, the iceberg meme. Exploring secrets, theories, Easter eggs, inside jokes, hidden references, and the odd meme. Always a fun time to go deep diving and hear about these sorts of things in a favorite video game. As we dive deeper, the items we discover become more obscure, strange, impactful, or just truly bizarre. And today we will look at just that, the iceberg meme for Goldeneye and Perfect Dark speedrunning. If you don't know what this is and haven't seen any of the numerous iceberg videos about Super Mario 64 or other games, just hold on to your hat and you'll catch on pretty quick. These iceberg memes are always evolving, changing, things getting added or removed or shifted around. The version we're looking at today is close to this one tweeted out by at the elite memes on July 15. So you can take a look there if you want to follow along with it. The first tier, the sky above the iceberg. Well, it's not even the colloquial tip of the iceberg. It's full of fairly well-known throwbacks and references, so come along for the ride as we go through this one. Here we go. The paintbrush slapper. So this is probably something you knew long about had you played the game as a youngster. On the dam level, if you're unarmed, then pick up the sniper rifle and then press A to cycle through your inventory all the way back to unarmed without fully pulling out any of the other weapons, you'll be holding what appears to be a large paintbrush as your unarmed slapper. This is just a glitch as once you have a sniper in your inventory, you slap with the butt of the sniper. So the game gets confused trying to load the sniper butt as your new slapper without wanting to change displaying the item you're holding or nothing. It's believed this is actually the back end of Bond's arm being displayed, which makes sense. You know it wants to show the back end of the sniper, but because it was never loaded, it shows the back end of your unarmed arm. And it does look like it could fit. So yeah, that's the going theory. But at the end of the day, it does look like you're just going around slapping enemies with a giant paintbrush. Streets 112, you almost certainly know the Streets 112 video, Ryan Lockwood's reaction to matching what was, at the time, a record held only by GoldenEye legend Mark Rutsu. It's sort of like a basic initiation into GoldenEye speedrunning, but as time goes on and the video gets older and older, I find more and more people who haven't seen the video. Anyways, it's just a very entry-level GoldenEye-related meme, perfect for the sky level of the iceberg. Look down is the act of looking down to reduce lag, saving about one second per minute in Goldeneye, discovered in 2002 by the late John Kaleda, who ever so literally told his fellow gamers to put your nose to the grindstone. It's one of the most basic speed techniques in the game and becomes completely natural to anyone who attempts to speedrun the game after about a week. The Damn Secret Island if you zoom in with a sniper from the bottom docks of the dam level, you can see this island, or at least tower, way off in the distance. As the story goes, it was originally programmed in there for some objective, where Bond would have to ride a boat to get over there, which is kind of weird to imagine. I guess it might work like in driving the tank, but rather than pressing B to exit anywhere, I don't think you'd be able to exit in the middle of the reservoir. So you might only be able to disembark the boat in a specific dock location or something like that. But it seems the technical difficulties in programming this in, combined with the game's development running several years later than expected, led to it getting scrapped or just ignored without the tower being removed. Anyways, even dating back to the early 2000s, you could get over there and explore with GameShark codes, so there are a number of videos about it. I've personally never been, and you wonder exactly what objectives this might have included, or how it would have affected speedrunning damn Double O Agent. But all in all, it's just a cool bit of discarded Goldeneye lore. Kapap 5. So hoarding is the act of getting a bunch of new personal records or world records, and refraining from posting them until a later point in time. This can be done for dramatic effect, to catch up to someone on the ranks who isn't suspecting it, or for any other number of reasons. A group of Goldeneye runners, Jono DSX Corner, Mirror Mage, and past champion Luke Sklars hoarded a number of times in 2015 and released a community feature film showcasing them all called Kapap. Subsequent years had similar hoard projects that were called Kapap 2 and Kapap 3, completing the trilogy. 
other Horde projects have taken place in the community, including K4 or Project 2020. So the idea is that Kapap 5 is always out there as some theoretical next Horde project, which is suspected anytime a group of usually active players have been suspiciously quiet lately. Mark Rutsu hasn't posted a new record in two years, must be hoarding for Kapap 5. Perfect Ace claims his TVs are broken again, definitely hoarding for Kapap 5. At least that's the conventional meme of it. Ricky the Rixer has a great video about these horde projects, so you can check that out if you want to know more about community hordes or understand the theoretical Kapap 5. The Missing Cheat Goldeneye has target times on every level, unlocking these in-game cheats which anyone who played the game would turn on and have fun with, messing around in the various stages. DK mode, paintball mode, slow animation… yeah, you can have a mighty silly time. There are 20 levels, thus 20 target times and 20 cheats, plus a bonus 3 cheats simply for completing Cradle, Aztec, and Egypt on Agent, Secret, and Double Agent respectively. This adds up to 23 total cheats, but the cheat menu has a room for a 24th cheat. What is this 24th cheat? Early internet rumors suggested it was a cheat called All Bonds, where you could play as versions of Sean Connery, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, and Pierce Brosnan, and many photoshopped images circulated supporting this claim. The Rare developers did want to include All Bonds, but legal nonsense seems to have gotten in the way. Whether this would be an unlockable cheat or just an in-game option, we don't really know. Another possible 24th cheat is something called Line Mode, which you can still unlock with a Game Shark. It looks weird as heck, and some have even wondered if Line Mode may have some advantages, like reducing lag. Which brings us to the in-game cheat codes. So while the cheats are usually unlockable by beating the game's various target times, there is another way. While in a level, you can use these Konami-style button codes to unlock various cheats. These cheat codes are often very fussy to activate, since they use a lot of the D-pad buttons, which are notoriously inaccurate. But this actually brings up a very interesting point when speedrunning the game. You see, when you turn on a cheat from the cheat menu and complete a level, you don't advance to the next stage when pressing A, and also a new best time does not save into the end screen, so the game knows you're using cheats. However, when you use the in-game button cheat codes and then a level completes, it does advance to the next stage and does save a new best time, recognizing the level as completed legitimately. So should these cheats be allowed in single level speedrunning? You can even activate them in the pause, so you could play Aztec Double O Agent, get to the first pause, then activate Invincibility, guaranteeing you'll survive the ending and possibly beat the current world record of 135 this way. Should this count as legitimate? Should you be able to activate line mode on any level and play with possibly reduced lag? After all, you are just pressing buttons on the controller in-game, as intended, just like any other combination of button presses. And I mean, is it really that much wackier than things we see in Ocarina of Time or other games? The vast majority of people seem to say, no, this should never count, it's clearly using cheats but I'm honestly pretty undecided on it. The Citadel is a long-lost multiplayer map which was partially made but ultimately unfinished. Numerous early game hackers found strings of code referencing it, and ways to unlock the stage became a thing of urban legend back in the early days of the internet. I'm not really a multiplayer guy, but there are videos of people playing the level on YouTube as a number of hackers and modders have rebuilt it over the years. Tier 2, the visible part of the iceberg. Well now we start chipping away and learning some of the relatively obscure bits of information and lore in Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. Some of these you might already know, but others maybe not, so let's take a look. Xenia on Frigate. It's easy to forget that when menuing into the levels in Goldeneye, it's actually presented like some physical files briefing you for the mission. For the frigate mission, Moneypenny's file tells you that Xenia on a top might be on board the frigate. This led to numerous early rumors about how to find her on the stage. If you turn on the tiny bond cheat, you can float above stairs while crouching. And this was often considered a good lead, with this seemingly out of place doorway to nowhere. 
but nowadays we can explore all the elements in the level and we know she's just not there. The level does apparently contain an inactive spawn for the helicopter pilot NPC, which some speculate may have been a Xenia interaction which was later removed. After all, she was a helicopter pilot in the movie. But then again, there's this helicopter pilot as a multiplayer character which doesn't seem to be Xenia, so who knows? Hugo Test. So this is the first one I think even regular GoldenEye viewers might not know about. Twitch seems to run all sorts of test streams, pretty much 24 hours a day, all named Twitch Media and some number. They often have a title which ends in the word test, some long, some shorter. For some reason, Twitch Media 39 is always titled Hugo Test, and is always streaming to the GoldenEye category on Twitch. And it's never GoldenEye, it's usually PUBG or Hearthstone or some other game. This has been going on for maybe two or three years now, it seems like most of these tests stream to more popular categories like Overwatch or Call of Duty. So for what reason does Hugo Test on Twitch Media 39 choose to stream to Goldeneye? Or was it just a random thing that this tester set their game to when they started? This is annoying for Goldeneye speedrun fans since you might turn on Twitch looking for a stream, see, oh wow, someone's streaming Goldeneye. But nope, it's just Hugo Test at it again. Overclocking is a technique familiar to most computer modders, where you increase the clock rate of a computer to exceed that certified by the manufacturer. This can be done on Nintendo 64, and its effects aren't all that well studied. Some reports seem to indicate that GoldenEye either plays absurdly fast, which would be obvious to any viewer, but other reports seem to suggest that you can overclock the console in such a way that it only reduces the lag in-game, while remaining mostly unnoticeable otherwise by the human eye which could be a benefit, and alas, cheating. Obviously, overclocking your N64 is generally disallowed in speedrunning in this case, but could there be some runs on the world rankings set with the use of illegitimately overclocked consoles? Perhaps we'll never know. Bond's Third Hand Alright, so with the epic dual-wielding Bond comes a variety of tricks and glitches. If you press A twice to switch from a solo weapon past the dual version to the next weapon, but interrupt the switch by shooting, you can get two mixed weapons. If you mix the watch laser on train with another dual weapon, then it'll appear as though Bond has three hands, two on the watch laser and one holding the other weapon. This is used for a swag effect in the GoldenEye tool assisted speedrun, and the principle of weapon mixing has at least some theoretical uses on Cavern's agent plausibly giving you the ability to shoot the timed mines for boost as you're running by, though no one has mastered this technique yet. Bix's Train Escape. I have a whole video going into detail on this one, so you can watch that for the full story. But basically, a former top 10 player back in 2005 had a run on Train Double O Agent, which shouldn't have completed, but did. You're supposed to have needed to injure Xenia behind Ormov to give you more time to escape the train on Double Agent. There are numerous comments on my video of others sharing their similar stories over the years, so perhaps it's not as uncommon as we once thought, and it's an interesting piece of GoldenEye lore and history. Unranked World Records This is always sort of a philosophical question. How many world records are out there which aren't on the rankings? We can know or speculate on a few, claimed records which seem legitimate, belonging to players who were removed for one reason or another, records which are being hoarded and will be revealed later, but is there anyone out there who has a bunch of world records, maybe even untieds, and simply chooses not to communicate with the community at all? It's an interesting thought. Barube's Dam 53, one of the original and most infamous controversial records in GoldenEye history. Boss untied Dam Agent 53 in September 2002. In March 2003, a runner named Dan Barube claimed to have matched the time. He had no video, which wasn't uncommon in that era, and he did have video footage of a few other world records, as well as numerous Dam Agent 54s, which showed 53 as the best time on the end screen. Ultimately, the moderators at the time decided to accept Barube's 53 on the rankings. The next 53 tie wouldn't take place until much more than a year later in November 2004 by legendary speedrunner Illu. 
Much contention has been made over whether or not Berube actually got 53, and it does impact GoldenEye history significantly given the importance of the record. Berube has always held strong in his claim that he got the time, however in early 2015 the score was eventually removed from the Elite rankings, and Berube's 53 was retconned into oblivion. Dennis Lucid is another story of which I have a full video, but the gist is that, around 2010, the YouTube channel of an unknown speedrunner who had no interaction with the community was discovered, and on it had a couple of untied world records in Perfect Dark. This stunned everyone in the community, and people debated whether or not the records were legitimate. Long story short, the controversy and shock surrounding the case ended up scaring Lucid away, and he hasn't been heard of since. But yeah, you can check the video on that to get the whole story. Japanese Joanna refers to the different character model of Joanna Dark in the Japanese version of Perfect Dark, not an uncommon thing as the games try to market towards specific audiences. However, on the Japanese version of the game, this laser skip on investigation is much more difficult to pull off. It seems as though you have two pixels of space to pull it off on English, but only one on Japanese and this difference is usually attributed to the character model being different. So the lesson is, don't try the investigation laser skips on Japanese. The developer hidden references are pretty cool. When GoldenEye was being developed, the team at Rare was largely a bunch of dudes in their 20s with little to no experience making games, so it's a pretty remarkable feat unto itself. You can imagine a bunch of young blokes, they probably had a lot of fun working on and creating something great they would sometimes try to slip references to themselves in-game. Some of these would get caught and removed by the Nintendo overseers, but others slipped through. Dr. Doak on Facility is named after Dr. David Doak. The Clob is named after Ken Lob. And why does the gate on the statue say BJ? No, it's not some gag or the reverse initials of James Bond, rather it's a reference to B. Jones, the artist who built the level and all of the characters. Stage 3, just below the surface. This is where we begin to get into things that, if you're just a casual observer just skimming by, you might have missed, or things that have a little more depth to them. But we're still not so deep that we require heavy diving gear. Yet. Fortuin T. It's not uncommon for players to make ridiculous sounding alt or gimmick accounts on the rankings and see how far they can take the joke. 420 was a gimmick runner who submitted scores of exactly 4 minutes and 20 seconds on all the agent stages of the game, including this Caverns Agent 420, which made it into speed lore as the example run. The times have since been removed from the rankings, and the person behind the 420 character is still unknown. At least, I don't know who it was. The OOK strategy, or Out of Order Keys strategy, or Double OK strategy, or sometimes called the M strat, is a ridiculous strategy on Surface 1 Secret and Double O Agent, which could save around 10 seconds. I have a whole video about this one as well, but even more than a year later, still no one has been able to pull off this strategy, and maybe no one ever will be able to. Cali W spent hundreds of hours untying these stages without the OOK strategy and it'd be awful to see all his grinding go to waste. But as long as the strategy is out there, there's always the possibility someone will use it to score a new Untied. Boss's Secret Twitch Alt. This is sort of the first joke or meme entry on the iceberg. Boss is a legendary GoldenEye and Perfect Dark speedrunner who has set more world records in the games combined than anyone else. He's appeared at speedrun events in person, but never streamed his gameplay on Twitch or anywhere. Could he have a secret alt account that no one has ever discovered or seen? Probably not. It's fun to think about and often memed about within the community, but odds are he'll just never stream. It's not for everyone, after all. But I guess we can always hope. Bond Out of Bounds refers to the handful of incidents where, well you clip Out of Bounds in Goldeneye. This is exceedingly rare, and unlike Perfect Dark, where Out of Bounds are regularly used in speedrun strategies, there are no known uses for this in Goldeneye. At least, none yet. 
We've seen it on train, silo, and streets, and you'd think on streets it might be useful because the only objective on agent is just get to the end. However, all the buildings have tons of invisible walls, making it very challenging to get anywhere. I do think this deserves another look, but for now, nothing has come of it. Fantasy League Hoarders This one is starting to get pretty niche, but for the past few summers, the community has held a Fantasy League to maintain and generate interest and encourage new players on the GoldenEye Perfect Dark rankings. Basically, you gain points as you usually would on the rankings, but you group with a team who are together accumulating Fantasy League points over the course of the competition. For example, if you get a new PB worth 10 points, you'll gain 10 Fantasy points as well. There are some bonuses for world records, as well as a daily bonus, where one level in Goldeneye and Perfect Dark offers 25 bonus points for any submitted PB. The theory goes that some runners score PBs over the course of the winter, and hoard these PBs until it's Fantasy League, so they can score daily bonus points for these PBs, pretending they achieve them on the day of the daily bonus. This probably doesn't happen, but when you're in friendly competition, it's the kind of thing people accuse each other of doing in a jovial and jesting spirit. Clemens myths are any number of claims made by all-time great speedrunner Dave Clemens, which are unprovable or uncertain strategies or technical advice. Some classic Clemens myths include picking up ammo on control during the protect lowers leg, or looking more to the right at this set of barricades on streets double agent helps avoid back boosts. They're sort of inconsequential, almost superstitious meme advice that may or may not actually help. These were more common years ago, but they're good for a laugh every now and then. After all, we all have our own weird superstitions or things we do in-game, our own Clemens myths that may or may not really do anything. And just sometimes, well, who knows? Silo Agent 99 refers to an incident in Clemens's chat where he listed his goal on screen as Silo Agent 100, leaving out the colon from one minute. This led a new viewer to inquire, is Silo 99 possible? Which honestly just shook everyone to their core. Many wondered, how could someone viewing a speedrun not know that time works in factors of 60 rather than 100? Or does he have a point, and is everything we know about time wrong. It became an instant meme, and that's really all it is. The sliding glitch, I just did a video about this, a rare glitch in Perfect Dark which causes players to gain an incredible amount of speed for only a few frames at a time. No one knows how it works or what causes it. You can watch that video if you want to learn more. Bo Peep was a speedrunner in The World Is Not Enough who set a number of really strong world records and also disappeared from the community without a trace. He seemed to take privacy and anonymity online very seriously, which is smart of him to be sure, so it's unlikely we'll ever know who he was or if he'll ever return. There's also a video about that story if you want to hear more. Damn Agent Slappers Only well, Damn Agent is the only barrier to being in the game of Golden Knight without shooting because of this locked gate and there being no explosives on Damn, no guards who pull grenades. Mad scientist White Ted actually found a way to lure guards to open the gate even with the lock still stuck on there, so you actually can complete Damn Agent and thus all of Golden Knight without shooting, which is pretty epic. Stage 4. Let's keep diving and get a bit even further out of view from the surface, where things become even more strange, niche, or obscure. Sakuya is a Japanese speedrunner once ranked in the GoldenEye Top 20, who set 11 tied world records in his career, so he's pretty good. Little is known about him as there is a language barrier there, and understandably he takes his anonymity seriously. But he took it to the next level at a Japanese speedrun event in 2016, where he did an agent race while wearing a hoodie and a mask. And this was well before the whole world was wearing masks. Interestingly, the player he's running against, AO Shirt, isn't on the rankings at all, and nothing is known about him. They get pretty reasonable times in the agent race, so it's surprising that someone so decent at the game never submitted a times page to the elite rankings. 
and it makes you wonder just how many good GoldenEye speedrunners are out there who we might not know exist at all. Frigate Splices Still on Rankings refers to, well, the possibility, and honestly, near certainty, that there are some spliced speedruns which haven't been discovered yet. Frigate is the most common level to splice, since most personal bests runs complete Objective A, Rescue Hostages, in the fadeout, and thus it's easy to splice on the ending cutscene and an end screen. Given how modern video editing tools are more and more widespread, and editors get better and better, odds are there are some spliced runs still out there waiting to be discovered. Ammo off-screen is an in-game option which can be toggled on or off. The little ammo counter in the bottom right can be removed completely. This makes it harder to keep track of how many shots you have left in your magazine, but some runners swear that turning ammo off-screen reduces lag, and choose to do it whenever possible. These claims are largely unproven, however. Frozen Baron is a rare glitch where Baron Samdi on Egypt just freezes out and doesn't move. For a while, we had no idea why this happened, but now it's believed to be a glitch that can happen when any enemy with double Moonraker lasers rolls around. Occasionally, the roll animation glitches and the enemy freezes up. If you put on fast animation, invincibility, and let Baron roll around you like crazy, you'll see this will almost always eventually happen. Joey's Lost Horde Tapes this is a wild story where Brazilian speedrunner Joey HBG was participating in a horde, Project 2020. He achieved an amazing untied world record, Surface 2 Double Agent 121, recorded on VHS, and went to some sort of VHS tape digitizing store to get a video made. When he received the files a few days later, the Surface 2 untied was missing the first few seconds of the run, which would mean the proof video wouldn't be acceptable, and the run would become invalid. Thankfully, the store still had VHS tapes, and was able to capture the run in its entirety, which we see today. The run blew our minds when the Horde was unveiled, and it was a great success. However, one can only wonder were there any lost runs that Joey was simply too sad to tell anyone about? Have any world records ever been lost in this manner before? It's a curious thought. Back strafing advantages are rare places where back strafing can, well, be used as an advantage. Back strafing is slower once you're at full speed, but during the brief 3 second acceleration phase, back strafing is the same speed as forward strafing. And this is fairly new knowledge which hasn't become widespread yet. Back strafing at the end of Damn Double Agent after destroying the final arm definitely seems to be at least a couple of tenths faster. Could there be anywhere else in the game where back strafing is advantaged? XZC's Frigate 22. This one is a typical story in some ways, where a speedrunner decides they don't want to do it anymore, but they're addicted or don't have the willpower to leave on their own volition. So they have to make a huge paste bin or forum post retirement press release in hopes making a big deal of it will help incentivize their departure. XZC did this, but on his way out claimed he had tied Frigate Agent 22, a time he had been going for and had a few close calls with, but he refused to release the video. Chances are, most likely, he never got the time and just wanted to go out in a blaze, but some do want to believe that he actually got 22. And so, one can only wonder. In any matter, White Ted tied Frigate 22 with video proof a few months later, so that's that. The Facility Decoder Door Lure is a theoretical strategy where instead of completing Facility Secret and Double Agent as intended by talking to Dr. Doak, pausing, which takes 5 seconds, and then using the decoder to get this door open, you just shoot a bunch of times to lure guards to open the door instead. This obviously loses some time at first, but gains some in that you don't have to pause for the decoder. After all, you only have to get the decoder to complete the objective. It's uncertain if this saves time, it's so chaotic that it's hard to get good test examples from which we can compare video, but it might make the level more consistent since it seems we could get the decoder, 
which is an objective unto itself, from two or three of Doak's random spawn locations in the area, rather than just the one conventionally needed for world record speedruns. It's a strategy that definitely needs more study and analysis. The depot rocket shot is another theoretical strategy where instead of destroying this box, which sets off a chain reaction to destroy the ammo dump, objective A, you shoot out one of these rockets which can trigger the reaction instead. This saves some good time, but almost never completes, due to lag and other random factors with explosions in the game. But perhaps one day, we'll see a depot double agent record with the long fabled rocket shot. Stage 5. Now we're getting quite deep, where the entries are niche to the point that even many community members are probably not familiar, or the entries could begin to impact the game in very meaningful ways. The ghost door refers to any number of doors on the archives level which sometimes, very rarely, are wide open for you to strafe right through on your way to Mishkin. These are very useful and save some tenths of seconds, but it's unknown what causes them to be open sometimes. It happens. Ghost door. There are some shots you can fire which seem to increase the chances of guards opening some of the doors, but other times doors just randomly seem to be open with no guards around at all. The record on Archive's Secret and Double Agent is 53 seconds, but 52 is almost certainly possible and would be facilitated by having a few lucky ghost doors. But these have never been fully understood at all, yet alone to the point of understanding where we could start getting them consistently in speedrun attempts. Jez Homework Hideout refers to an absolutely ridiculous story, so strap yourselves in for this one. Jez was an Australian speedrunner, still in high school at the time, and a Discord channel was made in the Elite's server to help him with homework. Others would also share their homework or other interesting academic assignments in there, but the channel eventually went inactive after Jez's school was on break. In early 2018, after 2-3 to three months of no one posting at all in the channel, an admin deleted it from the Elite server. This caused great distress to a handful of community members, including Perfect Ace, who had some sort of math or engineering problems in there, which he'd wanted archived, but were gone forever. And thus, he and others reacted by making all of their world record speedrun videos private on YouTube, holding the rankings hostage in what can only be described as some kind of instance of mass hysteria. This in turn caused great chaos on the rankings as it became rife with dead video links everywhere. After about a week of chaos, it seems cooler heads prevailed and everyone voluntarily restored their video links. But yes, an absurd footnote in Elite history from early 2018 indeed. I know a number of people hear stories like this about the community and think, oh wow, the Elite must be a terrible and toxic place. But I don't really think that's true or fair. All gaming communities have these sorts of stories. The Elite is just more open about sharing and documenting these wild tales. And I don't think they take away from the positives at all. They're just funny stories everyone learns from and moves on and looks back upon occasionally with a laugh. The Control Protect Skip is a theoretical sequence break that would save around two minutes from all three difficulties of the control stage being the most game-breaking discovery in the game's history. This has been studied closely, and it seems like there's no possible way to make it happen, since in order for Objective B to complete, disable GoldenEye Satellite, the game just has to count the number of frames which have passed from when Italia begins hacking away. There's no known way to speed this up in any manner, nor lower the number of frames needed to pass for the objective to complete. Even the developers of the game seem to believe there's no possible way this can be broken. But hey, it is speedrunning, so who knows. The $7.17 Arduino was a bit of a meme from when Ace wanted to build an input display for his stream, using an Arduino he purchased off eBay for $7.17. Many of the more technologically illiterate leaders, including myself, were confused as to what exactly this Arduino was or what it could do, so it just became a widespread meme. Oh, Ace and his mysterious Arduino, what's he up to with it? 
Anyhow, we eventually got an input display working, which was pretty cool, though he doesn't seem to use it much anymore. Mark's PAL converter. This one is pretty interesting and somewhat controversial. So PAL is the European version of N64 running at 50 Hz, and NTSC is the North American version running at 60 Hz. There exist these PAL converters, which allow you to play NTSC versions on your PAL console and PAL TV, through some shenanigans where you plug in the NTSC game of choice, in Mark's case GoldenEye, and another dummy cart. The problem is, this has unknown effects on the gameplay and speed of gameplay. Illu tested his own PAL converter on the Super Mario 64 credit scene, and concluded that using an NTSC cartridge through a PAL converter sped up the credits by about one second per minute real time compared to an NTSC version on an NTSC console. It's unknown if this would have any effect on the GoldenEye in-game time. It might have sped up the frames in such a way where Mark was actually playing with a small disadvantage, having to react 1 60th more quickly than other players, or it might have been an advantage for Mark, saving him unseen time on many stages. Two of his most masterful records, Damn Double Agent 155 and Damn Secret Agent 116, were set with this converter. It's not something simple to test, since it depends on the console specifically, and can't be easily emulated. So who really knows? Woody's Silo 102 lost footage is just that. Ryan Lockwood is known for numerous epic reactions throughout his gaming career, but one of his best reactions was after he achieved a new PB of Silo Agent 102. The video was highlighted on Twitch, but we all know how unreliable those can be, and so the video was lost forever. Captain Santiago is a fun one. When playing Perfect Dark's Area 51 rescue stage, you can hear a voice over an intercom ask for Captain Santiago to report to Medical Bay 6. As well as callouts for Dr. Francis, Dr. Lovering, Lieutenant Deal, and others. But who are these shadowy employees at Area 51? Well, as it turns out, they were mostly named after members of the rock band, the Pixies, who were one of the devs' favorite bands. They don't have any effect in-game, nor are they guards or scientists you interact with, but definitely a cool easter egg. 2.x duos are simply the idea that GoldenEye speedruns using Control Style 2.x, which is advantaged as you can start the level at full speed, saving roughly 0.3 seconds, are not played by one person with two controllers, but two people on two controllers, and are simply claiming to be one player on the world rankings. This is a definite possibility, and something that may never be caught. After all, it's not without precedent. Bay Spoost and Mouser Scribe got a depot Secret Agent 43 back in 2006, at a time when that was the world record on the stage. What if one of them claimed they were playing alone, and the other was willing to go along with it? The uplink skip is a theoretical strategy on Perfect Dark's investigation stage. On all three difficulties, you need to use your data uplink to hack through this locked door, which takes about 10 seconds. However, much like on some other levels, you could disarm a guard and hope in his confusion he runs into and opens this door, saving some time. This is extremely difficult to set up and very hard to pull off. And you already do make use of the 10 second uplink time by completing another objective anyways, so this might not even save time, but it's a theoretical strat that is indeed out there. The attack ship ending is perhaps the most contentious and mysterious piece of all Perfect Dark speedrunning. I have two videos going into this in great detail, so watch those to understand just how much luck is involved in getting a world record pace ending. However, I'll add in one extra bit of knowledge. Behind both these doors, there are two Skedar, who send out spawns into the level. And only once the real left door Skedar and real right door Skedar are eliminated, does the level end. However, these real Skedar are loaded at all times, albeit cloaked. 
they are still vulnerable to fire, so by using explosions you can eliminate them early, thus ending the mission, skipping the whole random 20 second ending. There is a Devastator weapon on attack ship, but it's much more than a 20 second detour to go get it, so it doesn't quite save time. However, this knowledge is definitely something to keep in mind should something be able to make use of it in the future. The Alien Finger Medical Warning is something to take seriously. When playing with Control Style 1.2, the Alien Finger Grip uses the thumbs on the C buttons, and thus in order to press B to open doors, you use your index finger as it claws over top your thumb in what has been dubbed the Alien Finger. Some runners have encountered joint pain with this, needing time away from the games to recover, and this is something we've seen in other speed games or fighting games too. So listen to your body and know when it's time to take a break to let yourself heal. Now we're at the bottom of the iceberg, staring down into only a pelagic abyss. This is where things start to get really obscure and even a little tinfoily, so take some of these with a grain of salt, or all the salt in the ocean. Henning's Live World Records. So as with anyone removed from a game for having cheated, some of their scores were cheated, but others were probably scored legitimately. Henning, removed from the Gold Knight rankings in 2013 for having numerous splices, had achieved some world records live at meets with other speedrunners, which adds to the credibility of these runs. He scored a Cradle Agent 34 with live witnesses, so we can be pretty sure he actually got that time. He also scored what was an untied world record at the time, a Caverns Double Agent 133, during the great Swedish Elite Meet of 2011. However, Ilu, Clemens, and Base Boost were in the other room reheating Ilu's Swedish meatballs at the exact moment of the run. So some have speculated that Henning could have pulled some magic David Blaine tier trickery and performed a live splice while they were looking away. Which would honestly just be demigod tier if he actually pulled something like that off. But for what it's worth, I do think his Caverns Double Agent 133 is legit. Playing near the equator is technically faster. Okay, this one's pretty silly, but if there's any physicist watching this, please feel free to chime in. So my understanding is the faster you are physically moving, the slower real time passes. This is why astronauts on the space station have time traveled like two nanoseconds into the future. So the idea is that when you're closer to the equator, you are rotating around the earth more quickly than someone living closer to the poles. Thus, time is moving ever so slightly slower for you. Alas, speedrunners who live closer to the equator technically have an advantage over speedrunners who live closer to the poles. I'm not sure if this is true, so again, chime in if you know better, but if it were true, it would be on the scale of literal yocto seconds, which obviously isn't enough to affect your speedruns, which round to the full second. But still, it's a funny troll post explanation as to why Perfect Ace is so much faster than all his competition, given he's closer to the equator than many other runners who dwell in Europe or North America. Wouter's Lifetime Horde. So, Wouter Jansen is the original legend of GoldenEye, having been champion on and off from 1999 to 2003, and setting more world records than anyone else in the game's history. As his reign began to slip away, and others would pass him on the rankings, he'd post a quote, Let's see who's first by the end of our lives, leading many to believe that Wilder was playing the long game and would eventually return to his glory of dominating the rankings. That day hasn't come, now 17 years later, so some like to entertain the idea that Wilder might have been hoarding that whole time, and at some point in 10 or 20 or 50 years, Wilder will unhoard all these times he achieved throughout his life, bringing him back to first place on the rankings, just as he ordained many years ago. This probably isn't actually happening, since Wilder has posted a small handful of times since his golden days, but it is fun to think about. Performance Enhancing Mold Marks Dishes Alright, this one is just a ridiculous, silly one to think about. It's well known at this point that Mark's dishes is a big meme in the community, from a tour video where he describes he hadn't washed his dishes in over a month, 
since his friend Patrick visited. Um, I haven't done the dishes since Patrick was here. He was here, um, what was it? Oh yeah, August the 28th. So it's like a bit more than a month. <laughs> And then goes on to show his new untied record of Train Secret Agent 123. A record, by the way, which still stands today, eight years later. The idea is that the act of not washing his dishes for a month gave him some sort of competitive advantage. Perhaps some sort of performance-enhancing mold grew in his apartment. This is obviously just silly speculation to explain a spinner with otherwise seemingly unworldly skill. And yeah, that's all it is. Mark's dishes aren't even that bad these days in comparison to some other things you see on Twitch. So there's that. Now, as a brief addendum to this entry, it should be noted that Mark Rutsu recently scored Damn Double Agent 154, a new untied world record, and in the video for that run, he showed his kitchen where he cleaned his dishes. This kitchen's spotless. Uh, it's truly amazing and inspiring. And I guess this debunks the performance enhancing mold theory. The Dam Essay tutorial is a long promised tutorial for Dam Secret Agent by Perfect Ace. He was the first person to tie Rutsu's 116 after five years, and thus vowed in his world record post to make a tutorial about the level. Obviously, no one is obliged to make tutorials and share knowledge, and so the tutorial never came. It raises the question though. What spiritual knowledge might Ace have shared with the world had he made a tutorial? Would everyone else have easily improved their own records with this knowledge? Did Ace ever start and then leave the tutorial unfinished? How far along did he get? Nowadays there are some new strategies on Damn Secret Agent, so who knows if an older knowledge tutorial would even be that useful anymore. But it's a good meme and something people like to reference when talking about a far off fantasy event that may never happen. Ace Cop? Hey Ace, are you working on anything important? Uh, not really. Why? Train 104 Faster Than 103 is a video comparison made in 2006 which can only be described as a loss of innocence for the community. When it was realized that Henrik's Train Agent 104 appeared faster than Ace's Train Agent 103 speedrun. The way in-game time is or isn't exactly related to real time is something that's still not completely understood. It's at least possible that the 104 seems faster than the 103 due to video encoding differences. But what does seem definitely true is that real time and in game time don't always match up. For example, Cali W claims that his Surface One Secret Agent 146 was actually a few tenths slower than his fastest real time speeder on the stage, which was still 147 in game. In any matter, the way we cope with such a grim reality is by viewing the speedruns as more of low scores, seeking the validation of numbers on the screen, rather than any actually scientifically timed real-time record keeping of our speedruns. Super boosts are a fairly recent discovery in Goldeneye, in which, if you get boosted anytime you're unable to move, like in the pausing animation or in the opening cutscene, the boosts stack and can bring you to incredible amounts of speed. This makes you able to warp some objects in the game which could otherwise not be warped. It has no practical uses for speedrunning yet, and would be tough to use anyways because taking lots of damage will you tend to pass away. Plus, farming boosts by pausing in and out repeatedly isn't exactly a speedy technique. But it is interesting, and who knows if something game-breaking might be discovered later on using super boosts. The circuit board strategy is the topic of one of my most popular videos. Essentially, if you dismantle a second controller and push down on the circuitry, it sometimes freezes the in-game timer temporarily. There are a couple places where you can basically let an objective play out while the timer is frozen, and then unfreeze the game, saving tons of in-game time. This isn't considered a legitimate speedrun strategy though, as you're modifying the hardware outside of the game, but it is really quite an amazing technique regardless. Silo DLTK. 
Well, Deal Decay, or Dark License to Kill, is an extreme challenge difficulty in GoldenEye's 007 mode, with all settings set to their max percentages. Guards take 10 headshots to eliminate, you pass away in one shot, guards' recovery animations are as fast as possible, it's just super tough. Many of the levels take well more than 10 or 20 minutes to complete, even for the most skilled DLTK players. Silo DLTK was the final of all 20 missions to ever be completed this way, as it has an 8 minute 30 second timer before the whole silo blows up, and there are more than 60 guards in tight corridors, all of whom will end you if you make one wrong move. Only 5 people have completed Silo DLTK to this day, so it's pretty much the ultimate GoldenEye challenge. Stage 7. Now we're in nothing but black ocean. As our senses dissolve away and we're left with only darkness and ice cold water around. What bizarre theories or strategies lie down here? Let's see what we can see. Sound effects off refers to the theory that while well, using the in-game options to turn the sound effects off has massive lag-reducing power in-game. Henrik, when going for Train Agent 56, got a few good runs with sound effects off, and felt that the game was less laggy. Before any world records with sound effects off were performed, it was generally agreed that sound effects should be required to be on, as the audio spectrum is one of the biggest tells on whether or not a run is spliced, and allowing sound effects off would open Pandora's box, making splices way easier to go undetected. It's still uncertain whether or not turning the sound effects off actually reduces lag, and thus would be theoretically faster, if allowed, or whether Henrik was just experiencing some kind of placebo effect. And due to the rule change disallowing sound effects off, perhaps the full effects will never be known. Henning's Real Times Anytime a prolific player is removed from the rankings for cheating, it's always curious to ponder their real times. He was obviously a very skilled player, and a number of his records are almost certainly legitimate. But really, who knows exactly which ones are which? It's just something you can catch yourself deeply wondering about. How the rankings would look different, or what world records would or wouldn't have been set had this all never happened. You know, butterfly effect and all. The Depot Double Roller Door Warp is a strategy that some believe could result in a Depot Agent 22, as mentioned in the Depot Agent Speed Lore episode. But what should really be pointed out is that in the TAS, which demonstrates the Double Roller Door Warp, the collision on Bond is set to zero, which makes the second warp possible. It's never been done otherwise, on console, on emulator, and the feasibility of this warp is uncertain. This means that 22 is maybe not even possible in theory, and I actually really regret not clarifying that in the Speedler episode, since it's led to misconceptions over the plausibility of 22. If someone gets the second warp with collision set to higher than zero, then maybe we can rethink things. But until then, it's just a fantasy. The Caverns Agent 101 original video was recorded by Mark Rutsu after he untied the time, but has been lost forever. It was recorded in 2011 era Rutsu Vision, but was even worse than his damn records, and was later rejected as proof of the time. Having the original run would be interesting for historical purposes, but no one downloaded it, and even Mark himself deleted the video from his YouTube channel and then lost the file. Clemens would tie the 101 about a week later, and Mark would go on to replicate the time in 2019, so it's not as big of a loss as if, say, the video of a run which no one was ever able to replicate was lost forever. But it is indeed a significant piece of lost speedrun media, which we'll probably never see again. Are you f***ing kidding me, dude? I'm back, Moose! I got the f***ing wall! Ah! <laughs> Another lost media entry, Bix's lost twine tapes, are a number of VHS recordings sent out by Spearn or Bix in 2006, which were lost for about 8 years. Some of them were captured and uploaded in 2014, but the most important runs on these tapes, records on The World Is Not Enough's cold reception level using a pausing glitch, never made it online. A few archivists downloaded a torrent file from the original uploader, which contained various speedrun footage, but the interesting Twine videos are nowhere to be found, 
and so the footage is presumed lost forever. Goose is Cowan Hames is a theory that I'm the one behind the Dark Light 93 speedrun wiki page. This isn't true at all. We know the real Dark Light 93, who claims him and his pals would spend their middle American teenage ennui by creating a ridiculous speedrun wiki page full of absurd claims. But I can understand why a casual onlooker may create alternate theories around this character. It does bring up a question of ethics around storytelling YouTube creators, especially those who are the primary source of much of their content. Any of us could create some kind of absurd character whom we farm for content, despite none of it being real, and the audience would likely be none the wiser. Jorty's 131 was real refers to a claimed Aztec Agent 131 set by Steven Jorty's in 2002, which was 25 seconds ahead of second place. The conventional belief is that this was just a misremembered or made-up time from an era where making up times was commonplace, though people who know Jorties personally swear they believe he got the time. Jorties described a strategy where a guard would open the Aztec glass door, variations of which do work today, but none of them seem to match Jorties' original description close enough to make sense. This one is just a huge rabbit hole, and I do have a video discussing it in more detail, so you can check that out if you want to know more. The world record flight recorder is not the fastest. Okay, I really like this one. On Statue, there are nine locations where the flight recorder can spawn at the end of the mission. On all world record speedruns, we pick up the flight recorder at this position, hoping to get the lucky run where it spawns there. However, this location is basically just as close and maybe equally fast or faster. But we've just taken for granted that the world record position is the fastest position for the past 20 years without really scientifically looking into it. Anyone with ROM hack tools could solve this pretty quickly and determine an exact time difference between the two flight recorder locations and strafing towards the end. But to my knowledge, this has just never been done for one reason or another, leading some to believe that perhaps this other location is actually the closest and thus fastest flight recorder spawn in the game. The current LSU is being hoarded. Well, currently in Goldeneye, the longest standing on Tide is Frigate Secret Agent 58 by Luke Pettit, set on March 1, 2017. If someone achieved an untied before that date, but has been hoarding it this whole time, then this would be true. It would be an effective way to rack up a long standing on Tide since no one would know of its existence and thus no one would know to target it. The ethics of hoarding these sorts of records has been a topic of debate in speedrunning lately, however. The double pipe warp is a theoretical frigate strategy where you not only warp these pipes on your way back upstairs after rescuing hostages and defusing the engine bob bomb but also warp through them on the way downstairs. Logically, this seems like it could create a faster route, but the reverse pipe warp is a lot harder to execute, and once you get downstairs, there's absolute mayhem going on with numerous guards in your way and tons of lag. In theory, the double pipe warp should be the fastest frigate strategy on Secret and Double Agent, but no one has been able to make it consistent yet in practice. The Escape Hoverbike Sequence Break is an absolutely ridiculous strategy that could save something like 40 seconds in Perfect Dark's escape level. Usually, you have to wait for your pal Jonathan to break this wall, protecting him from guards the whole time, before he blows a hole in the wall. However, with extremely precise and blind grenade shots over walls, you can bounce this hoverbike up to the wall and mount it through the wall, breaking the sequence and activating a cutscene early. This TAS shows the strategy in action, though the hoverbike acts basically as a super bouncy rubber ball, bouncing off walls and getting stuck on the ramp very easily. It's likely this strategy will never be performed on console, but it is the biggest time save of any strategy that is known to at least be technically possible on console. Well, now we're at the bottom of the ocean, the Hado Pelagic Zone. Only the deepest, most philosophically game breaking secrets remain. Be careful, you never know what you'll find down here. 
Bond back in bounds. So we discussed Bond out of bounds, which seems fruitless with no practical uses. However, there also exists a theory that just as you can find a seam in the architecture of the level to squeeze out of bounds, once you're out of bounds, you may be able to find a seam to squeeze back in. This would open up a whole new world of exploration in GoldenEye speedrunning, as it might be possible to go out of bounds, take a shortcut around a building, and then get back in bounds to finish the level and any objectives. None of these back in bounds have been yet found, if they exist at all. Jorty's invented for speed lore. Again, this is a cool theory, but definitely not true. Many of the older speedrunners have met Jorty's in person, but the idea again suggests that any old speedrunner could be conjured up as a storytelling device. It's understandable given Jorty's is mentioned in nearly every speed lore, yet so little video footage exists of his records, that some would speculate, if even only in jest, that he is indeed such a plot device. But alas, as far as I know, he's a real guy who really exists. Then again, that's just the thing you'd expect for me to say. The Rail Jump is an incredible pipe dream strategy where you could clear this rail in the Mayan SOS level as you're falling off this ledge. It's just such a blatantly obvious theoretical time save staring you in the face every time you play the level, and it looks like it would save about 15 seconds on each difficulty since you get to skip going to this lift and slowly taking it up to the next floor. This is a strat idea which has been tossed around for 20 or more years, but you can't even come close to making the rail jump, nor is there any good way to get a super boost, nor clip into the wall and strafe along it to make the gap. But it's there, staring you in the face every time you play the level. It truly is a pipe dream. Will it one day become a reality? The time Eric was looking for. Well, what was it? Eric was a player who submitted three times to the Elite Rankings in early 2018. On his damn Agent 53, he commented, And no, this isn't the one time I've been looking to get in Goldeneye. He then got Runway Agent 22, a tied world record, and wrote, No, this is not the reason I joined the Elite. That run may never come. He then got Bunker 1 Agent 17 and wrote, 16 is possible, I think, but I will never go for it. A thread was made lightheartedly asking about what time Eric Sones was looking for, but he never responded, and he never submitted another time to the rankings. Was he going for some incredible untied world record so insane that he could not mention it by name? Was he trying to summon some Lovecraftian horror of a world record to terrorize and dominate the rankings for all eternity? Or was he just some bloke who liked being a little enigmatic, given his YouTube channel's name is Enigmatic Zebra? But what exactly was this man looking for? The comments left on Eric's three records leave only mysteries to which we may never know the answers. The FR is always loaded. So going back to the statue flight recorder, if you turn on the all weapons cheat and use the sniper to zoom in, you can see the flight recorder is always loaded far beyond the statue gates. Well, you might not be able to see it on a video capture, but I mean, trust me, on a CRT television with the brightness level up, you can definitely see it. You can shoot it so it's physically there and loaded, and you could presumably pick it up, but going through the gates unloads the mission. However, with certain Game Shark cheats on, you can remove the unloading zones of levels and just walk through the gate towards the helicopter. Here you can really see the flight recorder is sitting there, and interestingly, you don't seem to be able to pick it up. You wonder if the inability to pick it up is because you're technically out of bounds, and if you would be able to pick it up, were you able to shoot it back in bounds? However, it seems impossible to shoot it in such a way that you could juggle it towards yourself, since you know you're shooting it in the opposite direction. Or you wonder if you simply can't pick it up at all until after the helicopter detonates, at which point the flight recorder warps to one of its nine locations in bounds. Whatever the case may be, it makes you wonder if the FR being always loaded might hold a key to breaking the statue level wide open. The Chicago Ghost is... Well, I recently made a video about this one too. If you've been enjoying this video about the strange and curious matters in GoldenEye and Perfect Dark, then definitely give that one a watch. 
you'll probably like it too. It's a story about multiple reports over the years of a cloaked, crossbow-wielding guard randomly appearing in Perfect Dark levels, passing you away. It sounds so strange and make-believe and like such an urban legend, but many of the reports on it over the years are very consistent. And if the case is ever cracked, it may have remarkable repercussions on the way we play Perfect Dark. Zero Second Theoretical Maxes are a sort of philosophical endgame of speedrunning. What would happen if we were able to break the game in such a way that the end timer read zero seconds? Even as many records approach their maximum speed now, there are still optimizations to be made and speedruns to be enjoyed. But once we fully max out, what then? Is speedrunning just kind of over? Does it become this thing that's no longer fun or enjoyable? It's a strange kind of abstract argument where the goal of speedrunning is to get times lower and lower, more and more optimized, yet you don't actually ever want to arrive at that end goal when a game is completely maxed, lest the journey of speedrunning comes to an end. Free Untied's use extreme caution is, well, mostly a play on the absurd things you often see at the bottom of the iceberg memes. But it brings up a good point. Untied world records are usually seen as something only performed by the absolute best speedrunners at the peak of their career, or those willing to grind hundreds of hours to cut one second off a stage. But could there be a number of levels where just a little thinking outside the box or mastering a strategy no one else has mastered could result in you getting essentially a free Untied? Much easier than you could ever imagine? This is probably the case, and has been shown time and time again. So while a number of players, even towards the top 20, have resigned themselves to never setting an untied world record, this may not actually be true. Believe in yourself, and you can do amazing things. So that's the GoldenEye and Perfect Dark Iceberg Explained. I had a lot of fun making this video, explaining these short stories and details about the games. If you have any questions, definitely ask away in the comments, and I'll get to as many as I can. Thanks for watching, my friends. Stay true. Don't dive too deep without the right gear and training. And I'll see you in the next stream or video.